I consider this as the crown of the schedule. But uh, before I get there, um, our very thoughtful chair sent around a great cheat sheet to everybody to list the credentials of the speakers. The only thing I had is a one liner. If you see that, you don't probably, but I can read it. The man who needs no introduction. So I am not sure if I have any job here to do, but I'll try anyway, if you don't mind. So uh, I find uh, Professor Gerhard Wagner a towering figure and the pioneer of NMR from the earliest times, definitely from the times of multidimensional NMR. Uh, after his PhD, he uh, started at ETH at uh, 1977, then took a year long, uh, short year long uh, round trip in Cambridge, England then went back to ETH, where he stayed a few more years. And then he trans transferred to Michigan. And that was the time when Guy Montalioni was in his group, as I understand. And then uh, from Michigan, after a few years, he transferred to Harvard Medical School, where he's uh, since and runs a huge and uh, fantastic operation. So I find him uh, a hero of heroic times in NMR, if I may say so, multiple times, because there were multiple uh, gradual steps of NMR where he was one of the leaders and the uh, guiding uh, persons in that. So he, the first phase may have been the, the protein studies of BT, BPTI, which was studied to the death. <laughs> first time to identify the uh, chemical shifts and so on and so forth. So those early protein studies with uh, in the company of Kurt Whitley, uh, it was the time of developing, implementing and sharpening NMR tools for structural studies, uh, chemical shift as assignments, as well as dynamics. Uh, I still use his uh, seminal paper in my class about uh, NOE effects in uh, increasing uh, size molecules, so the lower and lower mobility molecules, so NOE was not a straightforward issue uh, at that time, and he made a beautiful summary of that. Also, uh, he was uh, uh, essential in introducing my pet fa uh, favorite pet multiple quantum NMR in uh, protein studies. And then he extensively have been involved all the time in structural biology. Uh, at some point, as many of the major structural biology in personalities, he also took on metabolomics. Uh, as I recall, uh, they uh, pro uh, uh, produced the first HSQ, high resolution HSQC experiment, uh, which took about two days, I believe back in time and then I could identify lots of correlations in a metabolic mixture. He was deeply involved and probably is still in nonlinear sampling, which is a method development and made a big deal and big change for NMR. Then he also in, uh, extensively involved in using nanodisks, which was a pioneering development. And he is very much interested in membrane proteins in applications. Fluorine NMR is part of the portfolio. And then uh, I could continue with that, but uh, applications such as uh, st studying cancer is a big uh, target for them, for him in person. He was a guide, guide and tutor, tutor of uh, generations, directly and indirectly through publications, which is approaching the number of 600 or so. Uh, and he is the friendliest and most forthcoming and uh, in the same time most modest scientist I have. So I would transfer the floor to Professor Gerhard Wagner. Welcome. Thank you, Istvan. Thanks very much. And thank the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful symposium. I uh, listened to everything. It's a lot of new things and a lot of young people uh, doing fantastic work. So at the beginning was said that lots of young people and there are still some old people hanging around and he probably thought about me. Uh, I still try to get my lab running. And when, when I moved uh, originally from Switzerland to the United States, 
I was motivated. I thought I could do something about human health. And uh, actually, uh, it was quite uh, in, uh, important. My first postdoc was uh, Guy Monteleone, and we had a project on tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha. And I thought it would be nice to do something about cancer. And, and so, and this was one of the motivations I had uh, to come to this country. And I'm still very much interested in uh, using NMR and other methods to target human disease, help people uh, overcome cancer. And so that's still one of my main motivations to keep on doing NMR and keep on running my laboratory. So uh, uh, since I was interested in this, I have to disclose that I, I'm involved in founding a com number of companies, and a few of them are still uh, relevant to what I will be talking about here. Um, so, uh, let's. So, this is about translation initiation and cancer. Um, this is a slide I copied from Naum Sonnenberg's lab, uh, Siddiqui and Sonnenberg, who showed this picture that there are different signaling pathways. Uh, that are related to cancer. And there are many inhibitors of uh, some of the parts of this, uh, of the signaling pathways. Um, and at the end, they all come down on translation initiation. And this, yeah, this is a, a, a process by which cells convince uh, uh, the ribosome to make proteins. And from this uh, lab, so from this picture of uh, Sonnenberg's lab, uh, there is this statement that cancers are typically heterogeneous, and then there are uh, drugs that uh, inhibit some key players of uh, of these pathways. For example, the HER2, uh, uh, ER, uh, ER1, and some pathways. And if you have one drug that inhibits one of these pathways, uh, you eliminate a subset of uh, uh, a subset of these uh, cells these heterogeneous cells, and then, uh, but then uh, it takes typically half a year and so on, the cancer comes back because you have not targeted the other, other uh, dangerous factors of these pathways, of the signaling pathways. But at the end, everything comes together on the uh, uh, translation initiation step. And uh, so it might be quite helpful if you can, uh, could get some more general inhibitors of uh, cancer, not just those of si uh, individual signaling pathways. And that's a uh, reason why we are very much interested in translation initiation factors, because here is uh, uh, that's decided whether cancers can make can uh, proliferate and make uh, uh, metastasis and so on. So we are very much interested in this step of translation initiation. Um, so. Uh, I was quite lucky to get into the field of translation initiation early on in the 1990s. I called up Naum Sonnenberg. I learned about that there's very little known about factors in translation initiation, initiation factors. I called up Naum Sonnenberg where I can get his plasmid for expressing EF4E, and he said, finally, somebody is interested in my protein. And so I made uh, very nice connections with other people working in this area. For example, Tatiana Pestova at Dunstead. Uh, 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 New York Center Medical School, and uh, we did structures of several of these uh, small proteins that are just ideal for, at this time, for NMR spectroscopies where we can determine structures of those like EF1, 1A, 2-alpha, and so on, uh, and so cut binding protein EF4E, and the first complex of EF4E with the scaffold protein EF4G from yeast. So we were quite happy to get these done at that time, uh, uh, and these were kind of uh, breakthroughs. We were quite happy about this. Nowadays, you just could go to AlphaFold, and you can get all these small structures uh, directly from software, but at that time, it was still difficult. Um, and uh, all these factors are either involved in uh, uh, binding the, the cap of the messenger RNA or interacting with the small ribosomal subunit. Now there's uh, uh, the structure of the 40S sub subunit uh, bound to factors is very well known. And this is a from a recent paper from the Ramakrishnan lab where we find several of these factors where we initially did the initial structures. 
Um, uh, but there's, this is cup dependent translation. So uh, the cup and the all factor binds to the five from end of messenger RNA and starts uh, uh, convincing the ribosome to synthesize protein. But there's also another way of starting translation is with internal ribosome entry sites. And we did structure one of those is EMCV uh, iris, a viral iris. And this was work by Shunsky in my postdoc in my lab. That's another way of getting uh, getting translations started. And the interesting thing was quite of an effort to get this structure uh, of uh, this iris of EMCV. And this has uh, three loop, uh, three stems. And there's a small one in here is all consisting of ACE uh, adenosine. There are six adenosine in a row. And this uh, fact that this one uh, binds to the first heat domain of ER4G, a heat domain, and it binds very well and is important for this viral uh, translation initiation. If you just make one uh, mutation in this six adenine loop, then it doesn't work anymore. So uh, we concluded uh, this structure is very much defined. So the individual stems are uh, very well defined. But if you make one mistake, one mutation in the six adenine loop, it loses function. So uh, we think this is a case of uh, a, a key uh, um, uh, fit, uh, key, you know, in a hole. It's not an adaptive uh, binding, but it has to have exactly the right conformation to be able to uh, bind EF or G heat domain one. And there are two or three aromatic side chains. We know uh, they go into some slots in this iris, and uh, and then uh, translation can start. Uh, so, having said this, let's go on uh, to. Uh, um, some other things. So this translation initiation is essentially uh, the cup dependent translation initiation requires that EF4E, the cup binding protein, binds to the cup, and then uh, this binds to the scaffold protein for G and other factors, and it starts. But there's an inhibitor of this interaction is 4E binding protein. It has a similar sequence as EF4G and competes with binding. And uh, uh, this is the productive uh, uh, translation initiation, which is not normally inhibited by 4-ABP. But if 4-ABP gets phosphorylated, it goes away, and then translation can start. So this 4 e binding protein is a tumor suppressor protein. And I will talk about much more. I know uh, uh, there has been a uh, uh, Quite Julie Foreman K has done a lot of uh, on a lot of work on this four binding protein. We worked on four BP one and she worked on four BP two. Also Sebastian Hiller recently has done uh, quite some interesting work on four BP one interaction with Raptor. Uh, so um, and we thought this is a tumor suppressor. And if we could find some small molecule in the inhibit, inhibit, inhibitors of this interaction, we could uh, do something similar like this tumor suppressor for a, bind, for a binding protein. Um, so, and this uh, is still interesting for us. We are quite interested in finding new small molecules that inhibit interactions of some of these protein complexes and have some uh, effect uh, to uh, inhibit cancer. Okay, so. Having said this, uh, translation initiation is essentially uh, uh, consisting of two different aspects. On the one hand, the small ribosomal subunit, the 40S subunit, has to be prepared to be able to bind to this uh, EF4F complex that's on the, that binds to the five prime cup of messenger RNA. This uh, structure of uh, uh, EF uh, of 40, 40S. Uh, decorated with different factors, initiation factors, forming the 43S subunit. Uh, uh, this is rather well defined. And from the recent CRIM progress, uh, the Ramakrishnan uh, group has uh, defined very uh, nice structures of uh, all these factors associated with this. A lot one is EF3. In contrast to this 43S subunit, as uh, the topology and how this uh, 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 EF4F complex comes together on the five prime end is still pretty unclear. Uh, 
So there are many factors. There's a cup binding protein EF4E, a scaffold protein EF4G, uh, which interacts with uh, an RNA helicase EF4A, and uh, the n terminal part of EF4G binds with par uh, uh, poly A binding protein, uh, which makes a, a loop with the messenger RNA. So EF4G has many, uh, many functions, also interacting with EF3, this one, which is on the 43S subunit. So it's a key scaffold protein. And there's also another kinase, MINK kinase, seems to interact with the C-thermal a domain of EF4G, and then phosphorylate a certain a serine 209 on EF4E, and there's a lot of literature indicating that this phosphorylation makes cells malignant. Uh, but nobody knows how this works. Uh, so uh, we have done structures of EF4E bind with a cap uh, or with a, a longer piece of cap, uh, and uh, in, uh, without phosphorylation, uh, serine 209 phosphorylation or uh, 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 aspartic acid mutation and so on, all these structures look very much similar. So uh, uh, phosphorylation of this serine 209 doesn't cause any change in the structure of EF4E, and that I won't have time to talk much about it. But it seems to be more important to interact with some nu uh, uh, nucleotides in the 5' prime end close to the cap. But this is still uh, very unexplored, and we try to understand it more. It seems to be uh, RNA-specific, and this serine 2-NI uh, seems to have an effect for, for uh, recruiting other proteins to this 5 prime end and uh, help making them uh, malignant. Uh, so this, uh, yeah, for F complex is what we are mainly interested. I mentioned for a binding protein. If it's not phosphorylated, it can bind to EF4E inhibits this interaction. If it's phosphorylated mainly by the raptor of mTORC1, then it dissociates. And the mechanism how it dissociates has been nicely uh, evaluated by uh, Julie Foreman K and Lewis was involved in this. I think it folded, folds this unstructured protein up when it gets phosphorylated. So, so much about introducing this system. And then uh, a first thing uh, we try to do is essentially inhibit this, this complex, finding inhibitors of this interaction, mimicking essentially the effect of 4 bp binding or helping it keep the cells uh, healthy once uh, uh, 4-ABP is phosphorylated and dissociates. And so we design screens for inhibitors of the small molecule of this interaction between EF4E and EF4G. This is uh, with this four uh, with a binding motif which is present in 4EBP and in EF4E. So we did a screen, and this was done by a grad student Nathan Murky in 2007, and we found. Uh, and at that time there was. Uh, uh, ICCB, an Institute of C uh, Cellular and Chemical Biology, which was set up by Stuart Schreiber and Ur Kirschner at the medical school. We had these physical libraries of about 16,000 or 60,000 small molecules and that uh, robots up to screen for inhibitors. And we did this here with a fluorescent polarization assay. We took a small peptide from EF4G, put a fluorescence label on there, and screened for loss of uh, uh, polarization. And we identified this first inhibitor, what we called for EGI1, which has uh, two isoforms, which has different uh, activities in uh, displacement. And we also have un. Uh, uh, inactive uh, inactive analogs of these compounds. And this was uh, quite successful. We could show that uh, these inhibitors uh, uh, inhibits uh, uh, causes, uh, uh, inhibits viability of some uh, jerker cells, which are uh, uh, blood cancer cells. And uh, you get uh, um, uh, uh, you destroy vi viability of these cells is using this uh, different concentrations of the inhibitor. Here, for example, a lung cancer cell line is also responsive to these compounds, so we can essentially cause apoptosis of these ca cancer, cal cancer cell lines. And here, we try it on jerker cells, breast cancer cells, lung cancer cells, melanoma, prostates, or AML. And uh, you also uh, 
checked what kind of uh, proteins are downregulated by this uh, compound. Increasing concentrations of the inhibitor eliminates production of cyclin D1, cyclin Y-fin, beta FGF, C able, C mic, and so on, B cell XL. So uh, it calls it downregulates some uh, 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 cancer promoters uh, in when uh, applied to uh, cancer to cell lines. And then we did uh, 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 xenografts, and it was done by Ting Fang Yi, a postdoc. I hired a cancer biologist in my lab, Ting Fang Yi, which was quite uh, important. And so uh, he uh, uh, designed a xenograph on uh, uh, female uh, skid mice. Uh, uh, where, uh, and we have independently, uh, Tinga has cultivated some cancer, uh, 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 some cancer stem cells, uh, uh, which we originally got from Bob Weinberger, modified some very aggressive cancer cells. If they are uh, uh, inserted, uh, uh, 10 to the 5 breast cancer stem cells in the memory pads uh, of uh, of these mice, then the tumor grows, and uh, we waited until it was about 75 cubic millimeters, and then we applied uh, for each A1 uh, in five five mice uh, for uh, IP for 30 days, and you see that the uh, uh, mice treated with this compound, uh, uh, the tumor growth was much smaller. Uh, compared to those that were just treated with uh, DMSO uh, interperitoneal. And you see in the non-treated cells, uh, you see nice red blood microvessels, which are completely gone in the, in the tumors uh, that were treated, in the mice that were treated with this 4 each one uh, uh, compound. So uh, it's a, a clear proof that these compounds have some activity against the uh, against cancer. And this was further developed. Uh, um, and then we did some experiments to see what is the action. So this is a West, uh, where we have an, a pull-down assay, uh, agarose beads with a cup analog M7 GTP. And this can uh, uh, pull down EF4E or 4 ebp or 4G can bind to EF4E. And here you have some pull-down assays, Western blots. Here is a uh, control you see a lot of uh, uh, what what is hanging on on the on this agro speed on the cup uh, affinity column and there's a lot of ef4e as for ef4g and a little bit of 4e binding protein but you almost don't see it if we uh, uh, pull that if we uh, uh, pull down if we elute with the cap analog you see almost everything is gone uh, uh, if you then uh, use uh, for uh, our compound and use increasing concentrations of the compound, you see that as expected uh, for G, of course, yeah, for E is still there because we don't uh, dissolve it from the agro speeds, but yeah, for G is almost completely uh, dissolved, disappears. So this interaction by 4 eg one uh, this, uh, displaces EF4G from EF4E. But to our surprise, 4 e binding protein uh, did not go away. In contrast, it was actually stab stabilized. And we were wondering about this for quite a while. Uh, it's still not quite clear. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, but 4 epp one seems to stabilize 4 uh, e binding to EF4E. Uh, this is actually kind of a miracle. And uh, so uh, we looked uh, uh, at a Stony translation assay, and we have cupped messenger RNA, uh, which, which codes for renal luciferase, that there is an iris, and uh, cricket paralysis virus, iris, uh, and then another gene for uh, firefly luciferase. And we can measure uh, the uh, production of cis luciferase versus the firefly luciferase. And we see that our compound nicely downregulates renilla uh, luciferase. And this iris dependent translation is not affected in contrast, it's even uh, upregulated. We still don't understand this. Uh, it could be that we uh, essentially uh, 
initiate uh, an iris dependent uh, translation so that uh, if we uh, uh, release uh, 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 the ribosome from the calf dependent translation it can work more on this or uh, can uh, lead to a different mechanism of translation initiation okay and then we did some anima it's an anima medium should show some anima spectra uh, this is a hsqc of ef4e uh, quite an old spectrum, and uh, the changes we see in the spectrum all locate to this, enter, this, this part of EF4E, while the peptide, the EF4G peptide, which we used for screening the libraries, is on the other side. So it's uh, not, uh, not orthosteric inhibition of this. Uh, of this complex. It's not where the peptide, the G peptide binds. And then uh, we succeeded uh, to the crystal structure uh, uh, of uh, the compound bound to EF4E, and that was worked by Evangelos Papadopoulos, held by uh, Jenny uh, uh, from the Harrison lab. And uh, you see that uh, here binds the peptide, and here's a uh, compound. That's an allosteric uh, inhib uh, inhibition. It must be an allosteric effect. And, and then for a BP binding, we tried uh, uh, making fragments of uh, for a binding protein and uh, see uh, uh, whether we can get a structure of this done. For a binding protein bound to EF4E. And if you use a larger frag, larger frag, we get very poor NMR spectra. If you uh, uh, cut it down a little, it gets back better. And when we had a fragment 44 to 87 of this 180 residue uh, peptide, we see a very nice uh, uh, HSQ spectrum. But when we had this, it also crystallized very well. So this is a full length for ABP, not, not folded up. Uh, but then we got crystals and uh, now Takase Kiyama, he got the crystal structure of this and it uh, contains this is 44 to 87. Uh, something around here. And uh, this is uh, what crystallized for us in the complex, but it does not contain the N-terminal uh, and C-terminal segments that bind the raptor uh, of the torque complex. So, uh, uh, and it contains uh, three of the four uh, major phosphorylation sites, and it did not contain those of the N-terminals uh, which uh, truly Foreman K showed uh, that's important for binding, uh, for a dissociation uh, from of four binding protein from EF4E. And this is the structure, how it looks like. Uh, again, EF4E, and here is this 4EBP bound with a uh, helix here, a kink or needle man, and then it forms this uh, uh, kink, uh, uh, a loop or kink, uh, uh, down here. And uh, this is again the structure, and then later on, uh, the Isoralde lab in uh, Tübingen, Germany, found that also EF4G, a fragment corresponding to this one, binds in a similar way to EF4, uh, EF4E. Now, the question is why does our inhibitor? displays uh, 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 displays 4G, but not 4 e binding protein. Uh, and uh, it's not quite clear even, but we think uh, there is, uh, if I superimpose the structure of EF4E uh, bound to the uh, uh, 4EBP peptide and also bound to the compound here, there is very little overlap, there's very little clash between 4EBP and uh, yeah, for G. Uh, and if you look at this here, I have the same thing. I should get this working. Okay, you see in the surfix, uh, uh, no, it doesn't work. In, in, in the surface representation, you, you see that uh, there is some hole underneath here. Mm. As a movie doesn't work, sorry. And there's essentially almost no clash between 4-EBP and the compound. So you think that the compound actually stabilizes binding of 4-EBP uh, uh, 
peptide. Uh, but we have not done the experiment showing that this is indeed the case. We have this in working. So it seems that uh, the compound really stabilizes for MP binding, stabilizes the tumor suppressor protein. And then we also looked again uh, at, uh, uh, at the effect our fragment 44 to 87 has. Here is a schematic uh, 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 picture of the sequence of 4 binding protein, 4-BP1, which has this uh, consensus binding motif in here. And these uh, yellow things are phosphorylation sites. And we get very poor spectra for this one. And the good spectra where we could get a structure was 44 to 87. It's also actually this construct here, which lacks the first phosphorylation site here. But 44 to 87 was our successful attempt to get a structure. And then we checked uh, uh, the effect of uh, 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 of the truncation that has uh, on the cellular behavior on uh, on the cell, we looked at the cell cycle uh, process. So uh, we may, we checked the different uh, versions here, is, and then we had a GST fu GFP fusion of the fragments, so we can detect it. And then here we have uh, input for the different versions uh, uh, we tried. And here's full length, and here's 44 to 87, and here others. And we find if we do a pull-down experiment, we see uh, only full length uh, for AVP and 44 to 87 is, uh, is, uh, uh, is associated sticks uh, to EF4E on this, on this cup column. And the others uh, don't. And then uh, we went on and see uh, what uh, the different versions have in terms of cell cycle progress. So we injected the different versions in, in cells uh, and, uh, and checked the cell cycle. And this is a typical way how to measure a, a cell cycle progress, uh, where uh, uh, we measure the density of DNA content in the cell cycle. And you see, uh, uh, if we have nothing in there, just green f inject green fluorine, uh, fluorescence protein, you see the three phases, the G1 phase, the synthesis phase, and G2 phases. And this is integrated what, how many, uh, what percentage of the cells is the different phases. If it takes a full length for a binding protein, you see uh, some changes, a little less G2, uh, but almost nothing is changed. But if you take our 44 to 87 fragment, you see everything is locked in the G1 phase. So you have complete cell cycle rest if you take this fragment. Uh, it's understandable because uh, yeah, we can... Uh, um, so this would be full length and this is 44 to 87. And this is 44 to 63. And it's understandable because uh, this fragment doesn't have the N-thermal uh, 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 N raptor binding uh, uh, motif and also not the C-thermal TOS mot uh, motif. There are two motifs at the both ends of 4-EBP, which anchor 4-EBP into uh, the raptor and then make it available for uh, uh, phosphorylation by Raptor. And there was a, a beautiful paper recently by, no, that's not, uh, so essentially we, we uh, stall the cell cycle in G1 arrest. At the end of G1 arrest, there is a, a, a control, uh, 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 control, uh, uh, is a control element that, uh, 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 and which uh, stalls the cells in this uh, G1 phase. And this is a similar effect as the protein the tumor suppressor P53 has. If P53 detects uh, in this, uh, in this uh, cell cycle uh, step uh, damaged DNA and so, and it, then it's converted to apoptosis. So our inhibitor has similar effect as P53 stalls uh, uh, cell cycle in the G1 phase. And this uh, is quite uh, interesting. Okay, so I have talked about uh, 
inhibitors of the interaction between 4E binding protein and EF3, uh, uh, EF4E or 4G and EF4E. So, um, and uh, I'm generally interested uh, uh, intermolecular interactions uh, uh, are very important in this EF4F complex and they have very little explored. And so, uh, uh, we were also wondering whether we could uh, uh, displace EF4E from M7 GTP and so on. Uh, I think uh, the mechanism of this EF4F must be related to modulation of interactions between different domains. So the structures of, the, of domains of this complex are known. There are uh, uh, three uh, models for the three heat domains of EF4G, there are models for EF4A, the structure of mink kinase, uh, and so on. Uh, but the topology, how these factors interact with each other, is still pretty unclear. This is probably known, this is an unstructured part, and so, but this is something we want to uh, uh, address. For example, uh, we want to go, uh, so, so the idea, what we try to do now is target EF4A, NTD, CTD interaction, or e, also EF4A, 4G, heat domain interaction, or others, uh, uh, 4G, uh, heat 3 domain interaction with mink kinase, uh, this would, this uh, interaction between these, uh, and uh, this could all have, uh, would, could easily lead to new interesting compounds, or it would also help us to understand how this complex interacts between, uh, how the different uh, uh, components of the complex interact with each other. So also, so we have tried to uh, find inhibitors of EF4A, uh, for g interaction, the so heat one domain of 4G, uh, 4G heat uh, three domain interaction with mink kinase and, and others. Um, so that's something we want to do. But it's uh, in the initial step, it is with screening and a physical library is about 60,000 compounds with robots. It's extremely tedious and long, uh, long uh, project to do. And uh, then you find out that compounds that pull out action are not so uh, they should, should be. So it's very, very difficult. Um, so and then uh, we can validate the effect on the function. Uh, and now, uh, uh, if we want to understand this interaction, we have developed a new tool for examining inter intermolecular interactions on a larger scale. And I was lucky to get a postdoc, uh, uh, Christian, uh, uh, Christoph Gorgula. He had developed uh, an, a completely new tool. So he uh, is a German, uh, he did his PhD in Germany at the Freie University in Berlin. And then he uh, uh, was came uh, to Harvard Medical School for a couple of times. They talked with Harry Arsenari. Uh, and both of them developed, uh, uh, applied, uh, he developed this tool and then it was the, uh, applied successful to several uh, projects. So virtual flow is a platform for in silico screening billion, more than billion compounds as inhibitors of protein-protein interactions. Uh, when we started with inhibitors of protein-protein interactions, we talked to Novartis and they said it's nonsense, you can only inhibit uh, enzymes. It's uh, uh, not a good idea uh, to try to uh, uh, inhibit protein-protein interactions. Uh, independent of this, Christoph thought about this uh, as, a, as a postdoc and he developed this uh, new uh, platform for screening large number of compounds. And uh, this project uh, was developed uh, as an open source uh, platform. So it's available, you can uh, use it and run it yourself. Uh, and uh, the idea is to uh, screen a very large chemical space. Um, and then uh, it has uh, uh, different aspects, uh, ligand uh, preparation aspect, where all these uh, chemicals that are known uh, on paper or from, uh, 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 from uh, uh, other representations and put them in a dockable form. So each of these compounds he, uh, he prepared so the different possible conformations. And if there are 10 conformations of one compound, then he talks 10 different conformations and see which ones uh, might uh, work well. And once you have this, you can dock uh, uh, 
uh, can run the doc. Uh, this uh, open source uh, docking program, we used only open source docking programs developed uh, from uh, 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 scripts, for example, uh, uh, like the Swinia or, uh, or other, other, pro other programs, and he uses all possible or the best one and tries them iteratively uh, to find the best docked compounds. And then what's done is uh, take a protein of a, a known structure and dock a compound or different uh, isomers of these compounds, and, uh, measure some uh, 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 free energy of binding, uh, and take a next one, uh, and next one, and then select the uh, best one. And then uh, uh, the success of this uh, technology is that you have to, to, uh, to try a large variety of uh, compounds uh, like this. And it has been shown, as predicted uh, uh, theoretically, it has been shown the larger uh, the uh, uh, size of the libraries, the better compounds, the better binder you get. It's like, uh, if you think about the Olympic, Olympic Games, the athletes from Switzerland, from the small country, get very few gold medals, and the United States gets many. It's because the screen, the, the, the library of the athlete is much larger. And this is the same thing here. If you go, uh, uh, this is from an experimental, uh, from an uh, actual uh, screen with virtual flow. If you just take uh, uh, 100,000 or uh, 1 million or 10 million, 100 million or a billion compounds, uh, then you get definitely better. The best compounds of each of these things uh, are uh, uh, much better at the larger the libraries. And so uh, we first tried this on a, a complex of uh, of keep one is an E3 ligase from the ubiquitination screen and uh, uh, which binds to uh, a transcription factor. Okay, and yeah, just here, uh, there are people, chemists think there are possibly 10 to the 60s, uh, 60s potential uh, compounds uh, uh, in chem space uh, in the name of uh, uh, that fulfills the Lipinski's rule, like less than 500, uh, 500 Dalton. 10 to the 60 is probably larger than the size of the, uh, of the atoms in the universe. Uh, but uh, there are uh, a tremendous richness of different chemical, chemicals that can be used to find inhibitors of protein-protein uh, interactions of, of proteins uh, with known uh, 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 three-dimensional structure. And this was the first uh, system we tried. So it is a, a complex of uh, a uh, uh, E3 ligase uh, from the ubiquitination pathway. It's called KEEP1. It binds nuclear NRF2. It's a transcription factor, transcription factor, transcription activator. As it can be, when you have this complex, it can be ubiquitinated and degraded by the proteasome uh, pathway. If you inhibit uh, this interaction of NRF2 with uh, the uh, E3 ligase with KEEP1, then NRF2 is, uh, stays active and can uh, 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 do, the, uh, uh, do the requested job uh, the, uh, it was this, uh, designed for. So this is actually a, a very well-known drug target uh, pursued by several companies, uh, including Biogen and others, uh, it, uh, uh, to help in heart disease and other, uh, other diseases. So this was our first uh, uh, target. And then uh, we screened uh, 1.4 billion compounds uh, in silico with virtual flow and then classified them uh, and bought, purchased the uh, 590 uh, uh, possible candidates. And then we, uh, we screened them uh, uh, with uh, SPR, uh, surface plasma resonance, and found that 69 of these bind, so a 10% hit rate, hit rate. And out of this, uh, uh, 12 had sub-micromolar KDs, high nanomolar KDs. So uh, uh, this is what you essentially get. If you uh, reduce the uh, uh, size of the library, you won't get this uh, large, uh, this uh, potent hits. Uh, if you, and then you could go on and do some virtual medicinal chemistry and can uh, get uh, the uh, affinities uh, even lower. So this was our first case. 
and uh, we could, uh, this was the work of Christoph Gogula with help of Hari Asanari. He was uh, quite uh, important in here. And this was then published in Nature uh, in 2020. So we are quite excited about this. Uh, but screening, so uh, uh, many compounds takes, needs access to uh, uh, powerful computers. And so we taught, started to talk to Google and Amazon uh, Cloud uh, uh, service uh, just here after the first compounds we found we checked with NMRs it's actually bind to keep one uh, and then uh, here uh, see the structure of keep one bound to one uh, uh, compound that's in the literature from a company and it binds uh, with a, has an IC50 of uh, two, 2.7 micromolar and we, we use the structure to uh, dock, uh, to use a virtual flow, flow to dock compounds into this pocket. And this was our best uh, compound at that, at that time. And it has an IC50 of 258 nanomolar. So we, uh, this represents the work of several of several years from different companies. This is the best compounds. And this was just done in, in, in a uh, couple of months. Uh, and then we could publish this in Nature. And here you see uh, we, how we characterize them. Uh, so these are two of the compounds uh, that have good uh, binding. We tested with uh, SPR, surface plasma resonance, and we get 140 nanomoles or 158 nanomoles binding. We did some CPMG uh, or STD, uh, NMR uh, 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 characterization and it's kind of consistent. And then we did a fluorescence polarization assay with the screen for displacement. And then they had, this is 258 nanomolar and this is uh, 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 2.7 micromolar. So uh, relatively good compounds, better than what uh, we found in the literature from industrial search for inhibitors of, of this interaction. So it was quite exciting. And this, uh, after we got this published, uh, 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 the pandemic started and the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, was a problem. No, I won't. Then, uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, uh, all uh, proteins from the COVID system were, uh, had known structures. So it was at the beginning of 2020. Uh, all these uh, structures were, were available. And then we thought now uh, it's a good time to try out our uh, our technology, but we need computing power. So we talked to uh, Google Cloud and to Amazon, and we got uh, free uh, 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 um, uh, free computer time. So we got uh, uh, from Google, we got uh, computer time on the cloud server worth uh, one million uh, dollar computer money, and from uh, Amazon, I think we got 1.3 or 1.9 million dollar worth computer time, and we could uh, run this on these uh, COVID uh, proteins. And uh, there are 17 uh, proteins and uh, 15 uh, target, uh, 45 target size. For each of these 45 target size, we run 1.4 billion uh, uh, test 1.4 billion compounds and. Uh, uh, one uh, and we got nanomolar inhibitors of each of these uh, interactions. So all these 45 sites, we got nanomolar uh, inhibitors from screening with this uh, system. And here is one of these uh, uh, this uh, complex uh, uh, NSP14 interaction with NSP10, uh, and we get uh, 15 nanomolar and 22 nanomolar. Uh, uh, um, binders as tested with SPR. And, and so this was uh, possible by getting access uh, to the supercomputers from, from Google. Uh, this was one, uh, was one million uh, computer, dollar computer money or from Amazon it was uh, time, computer time was 1.9 million uh, dollar. So uh, in summary, so uh, we had this, uh, system, we had 17 proteins of the system and 45 docking sites we target uh, and 50 billion uh, uh, docking instances and uh, 100 million uh, CPU hours. 
for this money. And the whole thing was done in four weeks. So in four weeks, uh, uh, we could get uh, in small molecule uh, inhibitors of uh, all these uh, interactions of COVID. And this was all done open source and it's published in iScience and you can look up and everybody can look for this. And this was a condition we have to make uh, the compounds available to everybody so that we got the computer money from uh, Google Cloud and Amazon. Okay, uh, so... Uh, this uh, is what we did to prove uh, that this technology is uh, uh, is working. And then we went back to uh, our ER4F complex. So uh, we thought we want to target different sites of this ER4F, ER4F complex. For example, uh, the active site uh, binding with M7 GTP uh, and uh, and then here, uh, this is what, what we all targeted. And here are the best compounds uh, in terms of uh, KDs. And so uh, this is a ER4A entity CTT interaction site. It's a site between these two domains of the RNA helicase ER4A. We got a, a 490 nanomolar uh, inhibitor. And this was, was all tested uh, experimentally with SPR. And this here is uh, uh, interaction between uh, for, G, uh, for a CTT and for G heat one domain. Uh, so the heat one domain and for a CTT, that is not, uh, it's actually the C-tone domain here interacts with the N-tone domain of heat one. And we got also a high nanomolar inhibitor and uh, heat one uh, for a, uh, 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 for a CTT and a HEAT1 and uh, a NAS, another one for a CTT, we get a couple of high nanomole inhibitors. And this is just these are just initial hits. There's nothing has nothing been done to optimize this. It's not drug development. It's just getting creating some hits. Uh, and this uh, was done screening 10 million compounds because this was not supported from Google. We had to reduce the number as the size of the of the library. Uh, so because we didn't have the money to pay for larger screens. So, uh, but uh, this uh, went, and drug development, we could uh, be working on virtual flow uh, uh, for medicinal chemistry that we could look for analogs. And so uh, this is all in the future and probably has some benefits. Uh, we could now go on and just uh, try ourselves uh, optimizing uh, these interactions like uh, for A entity with uh, uh, CTT and so on, or for A with uh, heat one. Uh, so that's uh, what we are quite interested. Uh, okay. Uh, and then uh, when we look again at this complexity of the situation, there are many factors interacting with each other. And we know if you upregulate uh, uh, EF4E, some people say uh, the Thunberg lab has shown that makes uh, cells malignant, uh, uh, run, uh, cause them into a malignant state. And so we thought that relative concentration of these factors may be important. So we made a computational al analysis by Su Wu, posted in the lab, uh, see whether uh, upregulation of certain factors are related to human cancers. And there are databases, uh, tissue databases from the Human uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which we can check uh, uh, what, uh, uh, whether cancer patients have a, dis dis uh, a change distributing of, uh, uh, of uh, transcribed and uh, translated components. And then the first one was to look at copy number variation in human cancers in this uh, human cancer genome atlas. So uh, genes can be at an RNA level. Uh, uh, and then genes can be upregulated by amplification gain or deployed, or they can be downregulated by uh, deleting one uh, uh, copy uh, or, or uh, uh, deleting both copies of, of a gene. And uh, this is by this uh, copy number variations by mechanisms which are very little understood. But we see, for example, that most upregulated here is CMIC is a known uh, 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 cancer uh, driver. 
And then also ER4G1 is upregulated and very little downregulated. If you look at ER4E, uh, you see it's uh, very little amplified uh, and also not uh, a little downregulated with gene deletion. So uh, this is kind of uh, unexpected because we always see ER4E is upregulated uh, to uh, 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 to, con uh, convert to transform cells into malignant state. Uh, and uh, this is now for all cancers that are uh, available in this database. And so this for G1 is upregulated. And for a binding protein, which is a tumor suppressor, it's uh, uh, to our big surprise is upregulated uh, and uh, very little uh, depleted. So, uh, so these are some uh, observations we don't understand. EF4E is very little amplified, but significantly downregulated. It's not what we were ex ex uh, expecting from this analysis, but it's still the RNA level. Um, and then, yeah, this is, uh, is here uh, on the wrong place. I just wanted to indicate what we want to look at. Uh, and then uh, there's another thing you can do. You can look at this cancer uh, data. Uh, you, uh, so, uh, uh, cancer Genome Atlas and look at the uh, so-called Kaplan-Meier plots. And it is how long can, uh, cancer patients survived uh, 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 and, uh, and what kind of genes are upregulated or downregulated. If you uh, look, uh, for example, uh, uh, for G1, people uh, live longer if they have less uh, 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 yeah, for G. So this is essentially the top 20, uh, top uh, bottom 20 percent of the, of the patients uh, 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 that have uh, 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 top 20 percent uh, uh, of uh, those that have G uh, G1 downregulated uh, uh, or G1 upregulated, they live less long. So blue curve is if they, if for G is upregulated. Uh, uh, then they have a, a, a shorter lifespan. Uh, uh, and then we look at ER4E, and then these two curves go completely together. So in this, uh, according to this data, it does not matter whether ER4E is up or down regulated. So it's, complete, it's uh, completely uh, the same. So there's no difference in the lifespan as we have a lot of 4E uh, or uh, uh, more uh, or less ER4E1. And, or, so the tumor drivers seem to be for G1, for A1, as the, uh, a surprising a e binding protein. If you have a lot of FOI uh, binding protein, you have a lower chance of surviving cancer for a long time. And so this is completely unexpected. And then there are these mink kinases, which are uh, considered to phosphorylate serine 209 and cause metastasis in in cancer patients, and they are always put uh, together. But if you look here, mink kinase one is very bad for it's a poor outcome. So who, those who have a lot of mink kinase one, they have a low uh, lifespan, and t mink two is just the opposite. If you have a lot of mink two, you have a longer life expectancy, and this is kind of unexpected. Uh, so th these are the interesting ones. And then uh, we looked uh, of. Uh, correlations of ER4E related gene expression in cancer prognosis. So, uh, and this is uh, kind of consistent. You see mink uh, here is poor, on the right hand side is poor prognosis. So it is in all tumors and here is uh, 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 different by a correlated uh, uh, analysis. And so if you have uh, mink one, you have a poor outcome. If you have mink two, it is a good outcome for you. Uh, yeah, for E is essentially neutral. Uh, so, and MIC is bad, uh, and for E binding protein, uh, two is, uh, 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 is a good prognosis, and for EBP1 uh, should be somewhere here. Uh, no, yeah, I don't find it. Uh, uh, so, uh, these are uh, some data that are not, were not expected uh, when we did this. And then we also checked for gene expression, uh, uh, correlated gene expression. And this is whether, for example, ER4G is correlated with many other 
correctly expressed with many other proteins, uh, yes, for E and for A1, for ABP. And this is for, for healthy tissues. On the right hand side is for, uh, for lung tumors. As this lung healthy lung tissues and these lung tumors. And what you see is a correlation of expression of the difference is highly dispersed, disturbed in cancers. So, uh, and you can classify this in those uh, related to cell cycle and diff three different classes. But uh, what, uh, uh, the take home messages in cancer, correlated express expressions of genes, transcription of genes is uh, highly correlated in, in healthy tissue, and this uh, uh, not uh, uh, this correlation is perturbed in cancers. If we put this in Venn diagrams, it's for healthy lung tissues, highly correlated for uh, uh, lung tumors, this correlation is gone. Okay, I should uh, uh, speed up. At the end, I wanted to uh, 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 describe a discovery of a new organelle. Uh, uh, which we call a cytocapsule tube. And this was the work of uh, this uh, 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 fantastic postdoc, Ting Fang Yi. He uh, uh, worked on translation initiation. He found that EF4F, EF4E is upregulated and hypoxia, as we have in brain and so. And then he cultivated aggressive cancer cells. And if you do it on a two dimension, that is usually done on matricell. It's a surrogate of the extracellular matrix. It's usually made, created for mouse uh, uh, cancers. And if you do it on a two dimensional, on a flat gel, you get these very strange uh, cell shapes. If you do it on a three dimensional matricell, the cells stay around. And then uh, that sometimes they go into the matricell and, and, uh, uh, and then he studies them and uh, makes. Uh, analysis, it's usually a day long preparation, and then at the end it fixes this uh, to have something to cut. And so, and there was uh, on one of the Boston November uh, winters, there was a blizzard warning. And so he was in, uh, in a hurry and uh, wanted to get the, as a green line to get home, but then he couldn't do the last step uh, of this fixation. Uh, so, and he went home and the next, ti next time uh, uh, he went in, he said, you know what, I see that his cells started to move. And then this is what he observed. Uh, if I can get this running, uh -oh, I cannot run it. So, so, I cannot get this movies running. Okay. No, no, okay. Now, here you see some, this is one of the cells on the enzymatic gel, and you see it starts moving, <clears throat> and it forms actually kind of a tunnel behind or a cavity. And we, if you look carefully, you see some spikes connecting the cell uh, to this, uh, and then it, here you see the spikes. So the cell makes a tunnel, and this tunnel is surrounded by a membrane, a bilayer, you see, uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, uh, after some time, other cells can chain, join, uh, join in, and you see that several cells uh, uh, move into these uh, cytocapsular tubes and change the direction. You see at the, at the front end, you have this uh, little antlers of what it is, and so uh, this was the discovery of this new organelle. Okay, and if you look at this here, you can see that cells make very strange things. So just make bubbles out there. Uh, and we always think cells are kind of simple and uh, have a nucleus and the cytoplasm and plasma membrane, but they can make all of these things. And if you wait a little longer, you see that cells can move in these tubes and uh, uh, form clusters and so on, networks and so on. Um, and then uh, you have kind of an initiation of this cytocapsular tubes, so elongation and then network formation. And at the end, they form tumor spheres and this uh, cytocapsular tube disappears. So that's how uh, uh, we think uh, tumors start from single cells and that nobody had known about this. Uh, we tried to publish this uh, uh, and then we could also do this in, in xenografts. I mentioned that we can make this xenograft uh, 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 insert uh, uh, aggressive cancer cells in uh, in the mammary pads of mice, and then uh, 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 after some time we cut them, and we see that the same uh, same cytocapsular tubes, or we call them tunnel podia, uh, show up there. 
and this uh, and then we can characterize this and this uh, uh, this, this is cello type uh, thing this side uh, this uh, uh, multi gel with the cells in there it's very difficult to cut them for, for electron microscopy but you can clearly see that there's a bilayer in here uh, so uh, and this is just one uh, little spike of the, the small part of such side, side capsular tubes and so uh, at that time uh, we thought this must uh, be a new uh, way of uh, uh, forming uh, metastasis and transport cancer cells protected from the extracellular matrix in these tubes and then uh, uh, this was published uh, in uh, PNS. It took us about three years until any uh, uh, until we got this published because nobody had seen it before. In the meantime, we have looked at many cancer tissues from uh, tissue data banks all over the world, and tried all uh, all uh, uh, all cancers, and we find that these cyt uh, cytocapsular tubes. Uh, are only found in malignant and metastatic cancers, not in uh, uh, benign tumors and not in normal tubes, uh, normal tissues. And uh, th uh, then uh, we had to get to know uh, how to uh, image this. So we did uh, proteomics on the membranes uh, uh, of these cytocapsular tubes. And this was kind of tricky. It took a long time to uh, be able to do this. But uh, eventually we found uh, uh, about 100 membrane proteins uh, in these cytocops, in the membranes of the cytocapsular tubes. And uh, 10 of them are specific for the cytocapsular tubes uh, and are highly upregulated and uh, almost not visible in plasma membranes of cells. And so we have some uh, uh, antibodies and we can stain this. And this you can see here, uh, these yellow tubes are the cytocapsular tubes. That's from uh, 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 colon carcinoma, uh, adenocarcinoma. And uh, based on this, we started a company that could uh, 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 get some money to further uh, uh, work on this. Um, so, and uh, it's kind of helpful, this could be uh, then these are found only in malignant met metastatic tumors. We can have uh, biopsy tools to uh, distinguish uh, um, normal tissues from malignant cancer tissue, and possibly we can also find small molecule inhibitors, inhibitors of these uh, tubes. So uh, I think I went over my time. Uh, it's, uh, I talked about translation initiation, uh, inhibit translation initiation, new ways of screening compound databases in silico, bioinformatics approach of translation-related factors and discovery of a new organelle, the cytocapsular tube. As this, I want to close and thank those who have done the work. Here, a list of this. Here, Christoph Gorgula, uh, who uh, developed virtual flow. Uh, Hari Arsenari helped a lot with this in all the biological experiments. Now, Taku Sekiyama, he did the structure of uh, 4EBP bound to EFOE. Evangelos uh, uh, Papadopoulos and Melissa Leche, they worked on structures of uh, 4E complexes. Uh, Ting Fang E is the one who uh, did a lot of uh, uh, cancer related work and developed uh, this uh, cytocapsular tubes. And Su Wu did the bioinformatics work. And sorry for overrunning the time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Gerhard. It was a fantastic journey through the jungle, I would say, of mm -hmm. uh, protein protein interactions and any other and all other uh, observations. And I, I do believe that you are making big progress, uh, improving human health and understanding uh, how these diseases can be treated and handled. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Luciano. Oh, get out. I'm uh, most impressive talk. I, I'm curious about the, the the docking protocol. Can you share what software you used and does it include it allowed for induced fitting some flexibility in the in the receptor binding site? Because sometimes in the protein protein interaction there is some adoption of uh, uh, surface residues. 
Yeah, good point. So uh, we include so the software we use. Uh, we just use open source open source software ah. from uh, 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 which, uh, but they are put together in this in this platform, which allows to use supercomputers very effectively. And this is on the web. You can find there's an uh, uh, if you look at the publication, you find there's an uh, there's a uh, link to the software. Uh, we're working, uh, we uh, are improving this, so that's not the final version, but what was used here is all open source, you can access it. And it uh, uh, includes mobility. Uh, so we had, uh, try about five or six uh, docking programs, Vinia and all of these, uh, you can find this in the paper. Uh, and it allows, uh, it docks all possible confirmations of the ligands. So we have ligand mobility and, one, and, and the program goes on different stages. You first do rigid docking, and once you have something that's uh, kind of interesting, you can include mobility of side chains and also mobility of the back, uh, backbone. But it's all how to manage the software package. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Any other question? Maybe if I may have one quick question, although uh, partially it has been answered. Uh, this very complex but still uh, seemingly steady uh, process and interactive network, is it uh, uniform or are there any dramatic differences between different cancer types? Uh, that's a very good point, yeah. So is, uh, we have looked at all uh, about 20 or 30 different cancer types. So it's all in this database. And uh, in lung cancer, for example, ER4E in this uh, uh, couple of microbes, uh, we find ER4E is, uh, makes a difference whether you have a lot of uh, or not. And there are a lot of details in there. And uh, each cancer has it somehow different. Uh, uh, but uh, Common to all of them is ER4G is upregulated, it's scaffold protein. It's dramatically upregulated. And also EF4A1, uh, EF4A2 not. So the different isoforms uh, behave differently. And a lot in there in the detail. Uh, so uh, we have properties in ISA in, in, in cell systems. Uh, and uh, was published just uh, a couple of months ago. And you can, in the supplement, can find a lot of detail about different cancer types. Thank you, thank you. Somebody else? If there is no other question left, uh, then uh, let's uh, wish Professor Wagner uh, uh, additional success to save humankind and uh, resolve these very complicated uh, interactions and uh, how to uh, control them. And let's thank uh, all the speakers of today, and then I pass the torch to John. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, again, a great talk.